spring webinar. Thanks for taking the time to join us today on a nice spring day. I'm Cheryl Kastronakis, and I am the Executive Director at Greater Mercer TMA, which is a Transportation Management Association. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Greater Mercer TMA, we are a nonprofit public-private partnership dedicated to providing and promoting transportation choices that help to reduce congestion, um, increase mobility for all users, increase safety and further sustainability in and around Mercer and Ocean Counties. Um, so before we get started, I wanna give a little housekeeping. Uh, the audience will be muted during the webinar and we will be taking questions um, after the presentation and during the webinar. So GMTMA's Julia Ibarra will be monitoring the questions. So if you have any, just pop them into the Q&A section. Um, and if we don't get a chance to get to your question during the webinar, we will ask our presenter to answer your questions and we will email you the answer. And if you miss anything, don't worry about it because we are going to um, be recording this and having this up on YouTube. So we will email everybody the link to that. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn this over to Julia, who's now going to begin with a brief introduction for a program that will not only um, help you step into spring, but also encourage healthier and more sustainable transportation throughout the year. Julia? Hello everyone and welcome. Um, spring is a great time to start a new walking and biking routine. And we at Greater Mercer TMA are sponsoring a Step Into Spring campaign to encourage children and parents to walk and bike to school. And to help parents to organize walking school buses and bike trains, we have launched the New Jersey Walking School Bus app. Um, the app is easy to use and parents can create walking groups and invite neighbors to join, plan walks to and from school, track miles walked, and CO2 uh, saved. And speaking of CO2, this week we are celebrating Earth Day. So what better way to um, celebrate Earth Day than talking about sustainable transportation, walking and biking. But we have heard from many parents who have expressed concerns about whether it's safe and where is it safe to walk and bike. Um, that is why we have invited Leanne Van Hagen today to um, talk to us about healthy communities, complete streets, safe routes for all, and more. Leanne is a senior researcher and adjunct professor with the Voorhees Transportation Center at Rutgers University. As a licensed professional planner, Leanne has over 20 years of experience in transportation and land use, planning, specializing in creating healthy communities, healthy and active communities for all ages and abilities through design, research, education, and training. Leanne is currently the managing director of the New Jersey Department of Transportation, Safe Routes, and Bicycle and Pedestrian Resource Centers. I will hand it off to Leanne, and we will um, show a short video about the app after the presentation and the Q&A, so please stick around. And Leanne, please um, take it from here. Okay, let's see. Whoops, still there. Now I can share my screen. Okay, give me a second to screen share. There we go, share. Okay, great. Welcome everybody. And I'm happy to uh, talk to you today. Um, as Julia and Cheryl said, my name is Leanne Von Hagen and I am a certified urban planner. Um, at the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy, which houses the Voorhees Transportation Center. Um, so welcome, and I hope everybody's eating a healthy lunch today and planning a little bit of a walk on a beautiful day. Um, but before we get to that, I'll be quick because I've been invited to talk to you about healthy community design and how you can have an impact in shaping health outcomes. To start off, one of my hats is to manage the Safe Routes Resource Center which assists public officials, transportation and health professionals, and the general public in creating a safer and more accessible walking and bicycling environment. The Resource Center is supported by the Department of Transportation through funds provided by the Federal Highway Administration. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how DOT is important in this whole idea of healthy community design. So let's start with this. There are three major pillars or foundations that determine our health. So before I move to the next slide, can you think of what they might be? Maybe you thought about your family health history. Does heart disease or diabetes run in your family? A family medical history can identify people with a higher than usual chance of having genetic factors that influence common disorders, such as heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, and diabetes. 
this is my family and my family's health history includes heart disease. So I have to make sure I am doing good things for heart health. Maybe you thought of lifestyle choices. Do you smoke or get exercise or drink excessive alcohol? As you know, these choices make a difference in health outcomes and longevity of our life. Or maybe you thought of your environment. Can you walk or bike in your neighborhood safely? What is it like to cross a street? Do you have a store that offers healthy food choices and like fresh fruits and vegetables that you can get to safely? My talk today will focus on this last factor, the built environment. So let's start with an important question. How is health shaped by where you live? This website states, your zip code is a better predictor of your health than your genetic code. And all you have to do is enter your address and it tells you the average life expectancy in your neighborhood census tract, which sounds fun, right? Maybe not so fun depending on where you live. I'm going to type in the location of my last face-to-face -face meeting, which was quite a while ago, I had in the city of Trenton. West State Street in Trenton is the heart of our state government and surrounded by agencies, offices, retails, food establishment, and many people who live nearby. I can tell you that people in that neighborhood would like to live longer than age 70, which is a 10 year difference to the average life expectancy in Mercer County where Trenton is located. This isn't just in Trenton. A very, in various cities across America, average life expectancies in certain communities are 10 to 20 years short, shorter than those mere miles away. Many studies show that zip code, race, and class surpass genetics and healthcare as predictors of health. Conditions in the places where we live, learn, work, and play affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. These conditions are often called the social determinants of health. When you hear that phrase, social determinants of health, think of this rainbow. It shows the relationship between the individual lifestyle and their environment and health. And pay attention to this green layer. This represents living and working conditions, including education, housing, employment, and access to healthcare. It makes sense that having a well-paying job can have significant influence on your ability to live a healthy life. However, where you live and work and the environmental conditions around all you have significant influence over your health. Now, what do you think the purple part of the rainbow represents? What is meant by general socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions? Put simply, this includes social injustice, injustices like racism that contribute to systematic poverty, lack of mobility options or good jobs, and a host of other unfair and unjust conditions. Now that we've looked at where we live influences how we live, what do we do next? One of the problems affecting our health is that daily policy decisions made outside the health sector often have significant health ramifications. Many of these decisions have unintended health consequences. So let's think about those unintended health consequences. We're going to play a little game. You're going to be health detectives and tell me if you think the environment in the pictures over the next few slides are good for health or thumbs up or bad for health and thumbs down. So you can play along at home. You can just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or you can put it in chat, say thumbs up, thumbs down. I'd love to see your reactions. So let's start with this picture. There is a person circled in red. Do you think this is good for health, thumbs up, or bad for health and thumbs down? If you chose thumbs up, I suspect it's because the person is walking instead of being sedentary while driving in a vehicle. If you th chose thumbs down, you probably are thinking it looks dangerous to walk on the side of the road. But what is the problem? Could it be there are sidewalks that are covered in snow that were not shoveled? This is an example where policy about sidewalk maintenance becomes a health issue. Many would not walk when the sidewalks are covered in snow, but some people have no choice if it's how they can best travel for work or other needs. Okay, another picture. Thumbs up, the environment in this picture is good for health, or thumbs down, it is bad for health. And remember, you can put this in chat, even just saying up or down. Okay. While the picture may look like a, an idyllic spot with trees, large houses, and plenty of room, as planners, we look at the importance of street connectivity. What happens if you design housing with large lots and lots of cul-de-sacs? You decrease the chances of people walking to neighborhood shopping, restaurants, and even to visit friends. 
If Bert lives at point A and Ernie lives at point B, you've turned a walkable distance into a 3.7 mile drive. How does that affect our choices of living a healthy and active lifestyle? Okay, here's another example. Thumbs up, the environment in the picture is good for health or thumbs down, it's bad for health. How good a health detective were you? You probably noticed there are no sidewalks along a busy road. You may have realized this mom is carrying a backpack for her daughter as they walk to the elementary school. But did you see the man in front? He is walking to a nearby train station. Now, how do I know this? I know it because this is my hometown and these are my neighbors. Here's another example. Thumbs up, the environment in the picture is good for health or thumbs down, it is bad for health. You notice there are elderly and crossing a major highway. Maybe you realize the road is two lanes in each direction. You saw the grocery cart and thought they're picking up food to cook. What you don't see is the retirement housing on the right and the local food market on the left, which requires them to cross four lanes of heavy traffic and a light rail. He uses a wheelchair. How long do you think it takes them to cross the road? Do you think they make it in one light cycle? They may have to wait in the middle of the road for the next light to turn green. Okay, here's a local neighborhood market or bodega. Thumbs up, the environment in the picture is good for health or thumbs down, it's bad for health. What do you think, health detectives? You noticed the candy, chips, and soda right inside the door. They're easy to grab and go. Lack of access to healthy food or food deserts is a problem in many neighborhoods. But you didn't know the location is right across the street from an elementary school. This is a common occurrence all over the state. The school officials can't keep the students from cutting the chain link fence to gain access to run across the street. A few years ago, a student was hit crossing the street going from the school to the market. Making the healthy choice the easy choice becomes more difficult depending on your surroundings. Now this could be anywhere in America. Thumbs up, the environment in the picture is good for health or thumbs down, it's bad for health. Okay, health detective, let's talk about this one. This company may employ many local workers and having a job is very good for health. However, is it possible for someone to walk or bike here safely or easily? Now, I know what you're thinking, who goes to Home Depot on a bike? Well, I'll tell you who, the employees who often do not have another mode of transportation. Look behind any restaurant, gas station, and strip mall, and you will find plenty of bikes locked up to lampposts and by the dumpsters. Now, if you wanna to go to the local Bed Bath & Beyond right next door, would you walk? It's only a few feet away. However, what I really want you to consider is why are all of these parking spaces needed? And I'll tell you why. There is an engineering guide that has calculations of how many parking spaces are needed depending on each retail type use. When Home Depot presented their plans to the Municipal Planning Board, they said they needed this many spaces for the busiest shopping day of the year, which is no longer Black Friday. Black Friday is no longer during the normal business hours. It's now spread out from Thanksgiving night through the following Saturday and Cyber Monday is often the bigger shopping day. People are shopping online more than ever. However, zoning that dictates parking spaces per building was developed decades ago. Having an abundance of free parking and requiring it to be built along with all new developments spurs the design of cities that depend wholly on cars, making it more difficult for people who can't afford cars to get around. Parking pushes everything further apart and can make communities unwalkable. Free parking is not free. It's heavily subsidized with taxes and drives up the cost to build housing and other buildings, which is passed along to the consumer or business owners. Just think about it. There is no land in New Jersey that does not have value. So that gets me to name the next question. How do you build a healthy community? So if you get nothing else from this presentation, I want you to walk away with three main takeaways. One, Streets are for people. Two, barriers can be overcome. And the third takeaway, I'll explain in just a moment. So let's start with number one, streets are for people. I'll frame streets are for people with this question. 
How can infrastructure or built environment projects play a role in the health of communities? And the Surgeon General happens to have an answer to that. The Surgeon General thinks creating walkable communities is an important way to address health. A Surgeon General's call to action is a rare science-based edict that is meant to shape national discussion on major public health threats. For example, the warning on tobacco products was an edict from the Surgeon General. What would our towns look like if we had public health warnings on unwalkable neighborhoods? What's unique about this report is it implicates America's car culture and sprawling land use patterns as part of the problem. More and more research is showing the health consequences of our unwalkable environments. Communities designed around more compact, walkable street grids have been correlated in research with reduced rates of obesity, high blood pressure, and heart disease, and they also have fewer fatal car crashes. So let's talk about New Jersey. How walkable is your neighborhood? There is a movement called Complete Streets that creates policies for municipalities, counties, and states to adopt that requires road engineering and design to consider the mobility needs of everyone. And by everyone, we mean all roadway users, all travel modes, including pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users, and travelers of all ages and abilities. Roadway design is no longer solely about moving as many cars and trucks as fast as possible through our communities. It's more about what is happening in our communities. This means creating streets for people, not just cars. Complete Streets addresses how all modes of transportation work in the same environment so everyone can travel safely. And it should be done in a way that is equitable, where investments are prioritized in low and moderate income areas and inclusive, which involves fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all communities. Once you th start thinking about complete streets, you can address other ways public roads can address the local environment. For example, we can design roads as streets for cars where there may be people walking and bicycling, but vehicles dominate the road and speeding along multiple lanes is pretty easy. We call this a street for cars. But you can redesign streets to accommodate motor vehicles and people. Did you notice the bike lane went from the side of the road to an inside lane protected by planters and bollards? We can call this a street for cars and people. But let's not stop there. We can redesign public roads to improve things like stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is a major source of water pollution throughout New Jersey. Every day, runoff from storms fertilize, carries fertilizers, pesticides, automotive fluids, and other pollutants into waterways, polluting lakes, streams, and rivers. Stormwater management is important to improving water quality and health. Not only does the street look nicer and more inviting with the increase in plants and foliage, but what you don't see is the green stormwater infrastructure that manages rainfall and reduces polluted stormwater runoff and flooding. We call this a street for cars, people, and water. And I do wanna recognize my friends at New Jersey Future and NACTO who provided these slides of New York if you were paying close attention, not New Jersey, but it's just a really good set of slides showing the differences a few years can make in design. The New Jersey Department of Transportation also recognizes the importance of streets for people. The new, the new Complete and Green Streets for All Guide propels New Jersey into the next decade of working to make our streets accessible for all modes of transportation for all ages and, and abilities. This model complete, complete streets policy guide sharpens the focus on impl implementing comprehensive complete streets policies, which incorporate green streets and green stormwater infrastructure into complete streets projects and prioritizes health, equity and fairness in transportation expenditures. And if you go to this website, you can find a Word document that you can download that has the model policy that you can share with your municipality to adopt. Now, I will say this, in Mercer County, you're very lucky because you have every municipality and the county have adopted complete streets policies. Now, some of them were adopted a while ago, and you might want to take a look to see if there's ways to improve and, and make a new policy that incorporates things like green streets, health equity, um, and even other things that are in the new model policy. Um, and I'd like to point out that if you look at these numbers, New Jersey is a leader in adopted complete streets policy. 
the New Jersey Department of Transportation was an early adopter with, who would, and adopted their policy in 2009. And over the last 10 years, we've had 169 towns and eight counties pass their own complete streets policy. And this is fantastic. Um, there's some new ways to look at the policies that do things like I just said, incorporating green streets, but also sometimes the challenge isn't just in adopting the policy, it's an implementation. So let me talk about that for a moment. And that leads me to takeaway number two, barriers can be overcome. We have many tools in our healthy community design toolbox that can be implemented to make our communities healthier. But there's often concerns and pushbacks to redesigning our streets, even if it makes them safer. Do any of these phrases sound familiar? This is where programs like Safe Routes to School or Safe Routes for All can come in. Children need safe routes to walk and bicycle to and from school, but they also need active transportation networks that provide a variety of de destinations and mobility options, enhance safety, encourage independence, and increase opportunities for physical activity that leads to better mental and physical health. Active transportation improvements for children are beneficial for everyone, including populations such as seniors, people with disabilities, low income communities, and communities of color. Giving students the tools to create better, safer environments can lead to some creative initiatives. And let me share with you a recent example. Uh, recently, high school students in Bound Brook, New Jersey implemented lighter, quicker, cheaper, short-term projects often called tactical urbanism. The idea behind short-term projects like painted decorative crosswalks and street murals is to make smaller incremental changes that are lower cost and low risk so people can experience what's possible and to inspire real change. Involving youth in community-based change has a multitude of benefits, including creating stronger bonds in the community and new future leaders. Which leads me to my final takeaway and probably the most important, and that is hug your TMA or Transportation Management Association coordinator. So what is a TMA coordinator? In New Jersey, we have eight transportation management associations that provide free technical assistance through their Safe Routes coordinator. These coordinators provide municipalities and schools advice and assistance to create safer walking and bicycling environments. Now, when I say hug your coordinator, I know during COVID that can feel a bit scary. However, I can't praise the work of places like Greater Mercer TMA enough. If you are not aware of the resources and programs, I recommend reaching out today. If you're outside the Greater Mercer service area, you can find your local coordinator at our website at safefruitsnj.org. Your local TMA coordinator can help with many programs and initiatives, like events to encourage walking and bicycling to and from schools, safety lessons, educational events, walkability and bikeability assessments, help with creating policies and plans, and identify ways to fund infrastructure through grants. Because of our coordinators, we currently have over 300 active Safe Routes programs across New Jersey. Another aspect of our Safe Routes program is our ties with Sustainable Jersey. If you're not aware of Sustainable Jersey programs and actions, I recommend you visit sustainablejersey.com and check out their resources. Staff that work with me at the Safe Routes Resource Center review all of the bicycle and pedestrian related actions for Sustainable Jersey and Sustainable Jersey for Schools. We also run the Safe Routes Recognition Program, which is coordinated with the Sustainable Jersey actions. For example, our Silver Level Recognition Award automatically gets you Sustainable Jersey points for the Safe Routes to School action. So let's recap. If nothing else, please remember my three takeaways. Streets are for people, barriers can be overcome, and you can get the help you need to overcome barriers by contacting your local TMA coordinator. Hugs are just a nice touch. So, Thank you for your time. That's what I wanted to present to you today. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. So please feel free to contact my staff or myself at the New Jersey Safe Routes Resource Center. And please stay health and safety during this challenging time. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Leanne. We will be taking questions now. If you uh, want to, you can go into the Q&A or in our chat. Um, let's we can start with um, one question, Leanne. If, uh, how can parents get involved in making streets safer for, for children to walk and bike to school? Yeah, that's always a good question to start with, um, because as parents, sometimes it does feel easier to just follow whatever the other parents are doing. And what we find is, especially with things like getting to and from school, which I know has been a whole nother level of conversation during COVID. Um, but it often feels like whatever's the culture in your town seems to be what works best. So some schools are very much neighborhood or oriented and it seems like most students walk and bike to school and that's happening across New Jersey. Um, but sometimes some towns feel like every parent is dropping off their kid by motor vehicle. They've got, you know, whether they're carpooling or not for multiple kids or just a single kid and whether they live far away or not, they're dropping their kid off by car, um, which creates a whole host of problems, not just with things like uh, more traffic congestion and, and traffic safety issues, but what are we really doing for our kids when we do that? Are we giving them the experience of walking and bicycling their neighborhood and, and getting the feel for um, how to uh, recognize when things are safe or not safe in their neighborhood? It is a really, truly a learning experience to learn from the ground up as you uh, age, how to navigate your neighborhood safely so that when you do find yourself doing it at an older age as a child, you're not completely surprised and, and uh, maybe not even really aware how to do things safely like cross streets. Um, so that's where the parents come in because sometimes the schools aren't necessarily gonna take that first step unless they see some other safety concern. Um, and so that's where what we would do at the resource center is often put you in touch with people like uh, Cheryl and her staff at Greater Mercer TMA and start thinking through, well, what does your neighborhood look like? What's it going on around your neighborhood or around your school? Are there barriers, what they are? And then that can set up a whole host of, of potential uh, next steps. Maybe it's an education program that's run through the school. Maybe you want to do a walkability assessment and, and the TMA coordinators can help uh, pull that together and coordinate that for your, for your neighborhood or for your municipality or for your school district or all of it. Um, so it, it's not always a, a cut and dry question. It often has to do with any particulars you're particular, you, you have. Um, we've definitely seen schools getting rid of busing and then and expanding their, their walk area. And what does that mean? And how can we address that before the busing goes away? Um, and how can we make sure everybody's getting where they need to safely? Um, and I think the way the question was phrased, it's not just about getting to school, maybe it's about getting to parks or even getting to some place to get food and, and drinks and yeah, it's kids. Maybe it is to go getting candy downtown, but you know, there, all of that kind of comes into that whole complete streets idea of, you know, how do we um, create and prioritize areas for those who need it the most? Um, and that's again, where I recommend working with the TMAs to do a more comprehensive approach. So you might start with a walkability assessment or a bikeability assessment, but you can bring that into a plan, like a walkability plan um, for your school, your neighborhood, or even say the school district um, or uh, other way to uh, identify a neighborhood school district. And you can identify the schools and the parks and really start to look at what are the, the barriers? What are the real problems to getting around? Um, so there's a lot more to the answer to that question. And Cheryl, you know, feel free to jump in because I think this really is something you all excel at. Yeah, I mean, we have, um, you know, there are many different aspects of the program that we can, I think, help work with parents to try to get involved with the schools or more involved and get uh, programming going. And sometimes it is a matter of starting with a walk to school event where it's the singular event and if we have that, sort of, um, we kind of get that going and, it, and, they, and parents can see the joy that the children have in walking and biking to school. I think it helps in moving forward 
uh, getting more parents to choose that because I know we've gotten feedback that um, as referenced about the number of parents dropping off, that that becomes one of the biggest issues in town. That's where the traffic comes from. Um, there's concerns over the, uh, the exhaust. You know, we're talking about Earth, you know, Earth Day. Um, in terms of anti-idling, there are parents that sit on the car line, not turning the car off. And we know it's a problem. And sometimes it's just a matter of them not being aware. So it's about creating awareness. It's not about pointing blame, but it's about creating awareness to the problem. And I think that, uh, you know, that's something that parents can do individually. They can reach out to the school's director. They can certainly work with us to try to get some of those issues, um, issues yeah. addressed. And just to, we tried to build this Safe Roots program statewide to do things like match up with places, programs like Sustainable Jersey, because you never know when what gets your foot in the door. So as a parent, you may be able to talk to your fellow parents, but maybe it's a little intimidating going to the school and saying something and, um, and going to those, you know, school board meetings or municipal uh, council meetings, you know, not always a pleasant thing to do, understood. Um, but there's sometimes things you can bring to the table that help get your foot in the door to have those conversations and things like a Safe Routes to School program or doing Sustainable Jersey ac actions can be a catalyst to working on a problem together instead of seeming like you're just confront confrontational about, you know, who's taking care of this problem. Um, and so we do this in many, many communities. And so often we can use what worked in this community and work with parents to see if it might work in your community too. Oh, you're muted, Cheryl. I'm sorry, I just see, uh, we have a question that came in about bike rodeos um, if we're planning to do them for schools this year. So at this point, we are ready to do them um, as soon as schools let us back in. It's, they've been really positive. We've done some, um, we've done multiple ones, either not just for a school, but also many locations of nonprofit organizations have had them. We've done them like in the city of Trenton. We did uh, you know, quite a few at um, in Point Pleasant Borough. Um, last, I don't even know it was last year now, it might have been the year before I'm losing track of years with COVID, but we will be ready to do those once we are fully vaccinated here and the schools allow us to come in. So we're looking That's forward great. to actually getting back out. And if anybody's outside the Greater Mercer TMA area, this is what I'm hearing from, the, we're hearing from the other TMAs as well, is, you know, they're itching to be do, offering the things like bike rodeos. And, and the good news of, of a lot of what we're doing with Safe Roots programs is they are outdoor events in which we can take better safety precautions. Thank you. Oh, we have another question here. Uh, Emily is saying the issue in my neighborhood is a busy road with not fully safe crossings. That is a state road, not a local road. So is the town hampered in what they can do to help? Yeah, uh, this is a really important question. And um, and I'm really impressed. Sometimes people don't always understand the differences between municipal roads, county roads, and state roads. And they all have, and, and that's what is a challenge working in this environment of transportation in, in New Jersey. And you know, this is a national thing too. Um, so yes, there ca it can be an added challenge to do stuff um, to, to address some of these issues on a state road. However, you noticed we highlighted Department of Transportation in this presentation, and that was on purpose. Um, we can put you in touch, and that's you know between my staff or the TMA staff, we can set up a time to talk, go over your safety questions, um, and be somewhat the connector to the state agency to figure out what we could do as next steps and what those might steps next steps might be. Um, so. Yes, it does present another layer and another level, but it's barriers can be overcome. I, I said it and I mean it. Um, and so um, we, I, my, my recommendation is to reach out to Cheryl and her staff and or myself and let's start a conversation and see what can be done because you know the department believes in the Safe Routes to School program for a reason and wants to be aware if there are particular issues or, or problems and challenges um, even on state roads. So Leanne, I actually have a question for you. Okay. Um, looking post pandemic, or, or, or do you think the pandemic in general is going to have an impact on communities and how they're addressing some of these issues moving forward? 
yeah, in terms definitely. of health, creating healthy communities. Yeah, and, I, and you probably can see both the pros and cons. I'm going to start with the pros because I like to th be optimistic, but we are seeing more children, students, and adults outside biking and walking. And that's not just a perception. We're starting to see some data that backs that up. Um, and some neat things have happened during COVID, um, depending on where you live, you may have noticed some towns that have done a lot more outdoor seating for restaurants, um, have maybe taken a parking space and created a parklet out of it and added more seating um, uh, or you know, other initiatives that they've, they've instituted to allow that sort of extra air, extra space to social distance and that sort of thing. Um, there's some preliminary research and, and surveying going on to show that in those towns where that's happening, um, they're definitely seeing uh, people's response to that as very positive. And they don't, people don't necessarily want to see that go away when hopefully COVID goes away. Um, so that's a good sign. Um, we do know many school districts prior to COVID and, and in a way to address things like um, the sort of too many vehicles at arrival and dismissal times have done other things like made temporary streets one way during arrival and dismissal or limiting vehicles in front of the school for uh, pick up and drop off otherwise. Um, and so those may be new considerations to schools that didn't do that moving forward too. So I think on the, on the plus side, we, we are seeing that, you know, there's tremendous mental health benefits to getting outside and walking and, and bicycling, um, especially during the stresses of COVID. And many people have turned to that to really, you know, help them manage their stress level. And it's not just adults, it's kids. We need the kids out of the house too, right? Because COVID has been too much. Um, so I think a lot of people are seeing the benefits of that and don't necessarily want to go backwards in that aspect. But on, this, on, the, on that note, we do wanna make sure that we are preparing ourselves to come back at some point, maybe as early as this fall, to not go back to the way things were. If there were too many vehicles that drop off and pick up and there's too much air pollution and all those vehicles discourage you from feeling safe for letting your kids walk and bike into the school. Let's figure out a way to address that now. So when we do get back, there's a new normal. And I know people are using new normal. It's a little bit of a, a cliche, but I think you know that now is the time to think about that and to come up with new plans. And that's, again, we have some resources at our Safe Roots Resource Center. We have some reports. We have a new report coming out about um, uh, traffic safety around schools that kind of get into what a, some of the, what I was just talking about. The TMAs all have some great ideas and we can brainstorm together to see if we can um, really take some leaps into how we address transportation and mobility as we get back um, after, you know, to back to school, back to, you know, maybe a different, a, a new and different, but working conditions and that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, we have another question here and the safety um, concern is a little different. Um, someone saying, I know a lot of teens whose walking routes through town are determined mostly by avoiding gangs. Other safety issues like the ones you pointed out are far less important to them. Are there ways to prevent both kinds of dangers to them and at the same time? Yeah, that is a tough one. Um, and you, the, the issue of gangs or just in general feeling unsafe is not a unique one to certain communities. Um, this can happen in, in, in neighborhoods all over the state. And, and when you really work with the youth, you can get a little bit closer to what it is that is, is the issue. Is it, um, you know, it definitely if there's gangs and avoiding certain neighborhoods, we've heard that one and we've, we've dealt with that before. Um, but sometimes there's other nuances. And so my suggestion on moving forward with that is if you already are working with these youth and you can better um, understand which the what neighborhoods we're talking about and um, what the safety issues and concerns are, um, there might be ways to mitigate th 
you know, certain things like that. It, it's hard to say, we're going to solve the gang issue. Um, that's a bigger leap, but maybe there's little steps we can take along the way. And I'll give you an example. Um, we are working with a middle school. I won't mention this town's name in New Jersey, but um, near the school, there was um, yeah, a, a, a stripper bar, <laughs> to put it bluntly, um, near where the elementary school is located, where it wasn't so much a problem as students were arriving in the morning, but the female students leaving at the afternoon felt, uh, felt especially uncomfortable passing where patrons of that bar were often kind of leering at the girls as they were walking by in the afternoons. And it was very hard to avoid that. Um, that's a specific situation you can find out about and, and you know, get some help from the town to go speak to the bar owners and say, control your patrons. Um, and you know, work with the town to address that specific issue. Um, when you have middle school girls who don't feel safe, that should be the priority. And, you, you know, bringing the town in is one of the ways we've found that's helpful to better fully address that. Gang issues are a little uh, more complicated. You know, there's often younger children in gangs as well, as well as, you know, or the same age as the children who are avoiding the, the neighborhoods. Um, boy, I mean, it's, it, it, when this has come up, we've, had to have meetings with the town to talk about different issues. And that's especially um, difficult in these times of, you know, police reform and, you know, issues with enforcement and, you know, I get it. I'm a white woman. I don't always know that I'm going to be the person welcome in town to, um, to talk about these issues, depending on where the gang issues, what gangs we're talking about, if there's ethnicities to that game, if there's not, sometimes there's not that either, really depends. Um, but, you know, th this is, there are resources out there. We can talk about what those resources are. There's folks we can get in touch with that are working in other cities and other communities across New Jersey and the nation to get some help, especially if there's specific issues. Um, and again, I think the, the, a lot of this is a conversation one-on-one -on -one to be more specific of what's going on in your community and not just give a blanket, here's what to do. Um, on that note, if you're interested, there is another um, sort of discipline within the bicycle and pedestrian community called crime prevention through environmental design. Um, it's not a magic wand. It's not necessarily, uh, the tool you definitely want to use, but it's something you can look into. Um, it's also it's often called CEPTED, C-P-T-E-D. Um, there's pros and cons to using that too, but that's one of the, the tools that are in the toolbox that you might want to look into to see if there's things you can do within the infrastructure to reduce uh, hangouts where you know you know you have conflicts between where kids that might not be, or, you know, young adults who aren't necessarily, who, who are not necessarily people you want hanging out in a certain part of the neighborhood. Um, but again, sometimes just uh, addressing that in this one location can move it to another location and become somebody else's problem. So it, it's definitely a multi-layered, multi-faceted multi issue. Thank you, Leanne. That was a tough question. Thank you. It is a tough question, you know, and, and these really are tough questions. And, and, and I know sometimes it, it may feel like the gang issue is, you know, the most pressing and can be. Um, but sometimes when you work with the youth groups and, and, and often the youth themselves have the best answer or have at least a way forward that they think might work for, for them. And so I, I highly recommend whatever answer in talking about this issue that we bring the youth in to talk about what it is that they really see as the problem and do they have ideas on their own for the solution? Um, because it's incredible what we've worked with students across the state, like, like I showed in the, the video from Boundbrook, you know, that was, that was a lot their idea. They wanted to do things like rainbow crosswalks. And that may seem like, what do rainbow crosswalks have to do with gangs? Well, they saw it this way. Um, rainbow cross crosswalks in front of the elementary school already says, in, talks about inclusion. Um, and they wanted to make sure that there was a statement about inclusion. So 
um, certain students were not feeling like they were not part of the community. And sometimes you can make that connection between gang members and not feeling part of the community. So yeah, it's not the most direct line from one to the other, but it's, it's something that the students came up with themselves. And, and another thing they did in their street murals, which was kind of interesting, is they put in sim symbols to reflect um, suicide prevention, which was another idea they came up with. Um, so you never know really until you really get those youth involved, they, they often come up with ideas that would never occur to us or wouldn't be necessarily forefront in our mind, but something that they see as helpful to addressing a problem, even if it doesn't necessarily seem like it's a direct connection, you'd be surprised. Thank you. Um, and this may be somehow um, related in, uh, as in, in terms of engagement. Um, this question, what's the best way to get uh, my kid's school to be more supportive or involved in encouraging biking and walking to school, or at least discourage so many parents from driving their, their um, children to school? Yeah, that's a daily challenge, right, Cheryl? <laughs> Oh, you're muted. Um, so um, again, working with the TMAs, I'm just gonna keep saying that out loud, you know, 50 more times. Um, but it is through things like Sustainable Jersey for Schools can kind of give it that extra level of, um, oh, this is a real thing. <laughs> Because again, sometimes it can feel like maybe the parents are just here to complain. And you know, school boards have a lot of other things on their plates. But I will say this, sometimes our more successive successful programs and safe routes to school aren't necessarily where the schools are running the programs, it's where the parents are, where a community organization is, is more involved. Um, and that's okay. Um, sometimes all you need from the schools is not hearing the word no and doing it anyway. <laughs> Um, so you definitely want to involve the schools because if you're doing anything on school property, they're going to want to be part of it. Um, you know, if you have a successful parent teacher organization, there's another uh, avenue in and they can bring it to the school, but not every school has that. Um, if you have uh, a municipal organization that has uh, some interest uh, like the green teams for sustainable Jersey, or maybe there's even a faith-based organization, um, they can often help with that sort of way in the door. Um, and um, if you can show, sometimes it does take one or two sort of key events. So I, I know I have plenty of stories. I know Greater Mercer TMA has many of the same stories, but we've, we've often worked with schools who are very much on the no side and we've just said, okay, listen, we're going to help you run a walk to school day event. And, he, you know, we're going to basically take care of the organization. What we need from you is just sending information out to parents. Um, and, and you're, you're okay with this, but you know, we're not really taking away teacher time. You, it's all before the school bell rings or after school, if it's another type of event like bike rodeo. And we're going to just see how it goes. And we just need, you know, you to say, you know, we, we just would like your support moving forward. And um, we've held that one event and we've then had a teacher, a principal, um, you know, a school administrator come to us after the event and go, wow, that's what this is. It didn't occur to me how special a day and event this was until I saw it in action. This was amazing. When can we do our next one? And so it, it's taking those little incremental steps that can have the bigger dis, uh, difference and make the bigger difference in the long run. So um, I have stories, Greater Mercer TMA has stories. We'd love to share our stories with you and think about maybe how that can be the catalyst for something in your neighborhood or school district. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. So if you don't have any more questions, we would like to share the Walking School Bus video with you. And just a second, I seem to have a little snafu. <laughs> Here we go. Meet 
walking school bus. What is a walking school bus? Parents. Parents walking children to and from school are a walking school bus. Since walking contributes to overall health and fitness, as well as the alertness and readiness to learn, a walking school bus is an ideal method for getting your kids to school. And with the app, it's a breeze. Once registered, parents can easily create and plan walks to and from school. Start by searching by elementary school, city, or name for existing walking groups. When you find the perfect walking group, go ahead and send a request to join. Don't see the perfect group? You can easily create a new walking group just for your school and start walking with friends and neighbors. The best part? Simply invite people to join and spread the walking duties across different parents. It's really that easy. Have your child walk every day or on selected days of the week. Every group has at least one parent leader for each walk, so your child may walk every day while you may choose to walk only occasionally or not at all. So each group plans a walk schedule that works best for them. When the walk is completed, simply press Finish Walk to alert the other parents that their children arrived at school. The app also features group text for fast and easy communication, like alerting parents when a child is running late. Walking School Bus believes in the safety of all children. That's why only parents with a verified child will be allowed to participate. And as a bonus, the app calculates miles walked and CO2 emissions reduced for each walker and group. How cool is that? Search for the New Jersey Walking School Bus app for your Apple or Android device and download today. And that is the Walking School Bus app. Um, you can find it in the store, as we said. We will be sending an email follow-up with more resources and uh, also links to the app. I would like to thank you, Leanne, so much for uh, coming in today and talking to us about Complete Streets and um, safe routes and all the healthy communities information that you have offered. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. The recording of the webinar will be available on YouTube. And um, as I said, I will have one email follow up with the link to the recording and more resources from me and, and from us. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much. And I am so excited for your walking school bus app. That is really, really neat stuff. Love it. Thank Thanks, you. Diane. We I are really too. appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great week, the rest of the week, everyone. Thank you very much again.